forever. I want to talk tonight about the laws of the anointing. There are some principles that you might already know, and there are some principles that you might not know, but there are basically four major points and four sub-points that we will look at in regards to the law of the anointing. You know, as uh, Pastor Perry said in his opening line that, you know, we need to increase our capacity. Our capacity that God's given us is in the supernatural. Amen. Right. You know, we spend, we spend so much of our effort in the natural and we miss out God's capacity that works in us. Amen. And God's capacity is the anointing. Hallelujah. Amen. The anointing, right? The anointing is the key that works in our lives. If you have the anointing, you can see faster results. You can see uh, greater effectiveness in your walk, right. okay? in your ministry, uh, in your personal life, in your uh, corporate life, in your family, you will see it. Right. Why? Because of the anointing. Right. Hallelujah. So the anointing, the anointing, okay, it's, it's a very critical factor. Okay? It's by which heaven measures our ability. Amen. Heaven does not look at our strength. Neither does it look, to look at our bank account. It means nothing. Amen. Are you with me? Come on. Right. The streets of heaven are gold. Amen. Right. 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 Right? So, in heaven, okay, our greatness is measured by how much of God is inside of us. So, God needs to increase on the inside of us. So, tonight we want to talk about the laws of the anointing, right? So there are eight principles that we want to look at, four major principles and four sub-principles, okay? Every book of the, of the Bible has a secret, okay? And the secret of the subject of the anointing is hidden in the life of this man called Elijah, okay? And some of the other prophets that are mentioned in First Kings. So we're going to look at First Kings, and we're going to draw out principles, okay, from this one book, right? Because as we draw out these principles, I just pray that tonight that, you know, uh, that, that we have some direction where we are heading to, amen? The, the greatest, you know, the worst thing rather, you know, I heard uh, one of the words that were released uh, earlier tonight. One of the worst things is when, you know, believers live in apathy. Okay? When we live in complacency. Why? Because when we do that, okay, what happens? Not just we miss what God has. Okay? Our family misses what God has. That's right. Are you following me? Well, right? Nice. Why? Because some things cannot be changed in the natural. It takes the anointing to change it. Right. Are you following me? Right? One of the reasons why I birthed history maker, okay, why the Holy Spirit led me to birth history maker was because I was about to start the church, okay, in the year 1999, I was about to start it. The same season I was about to start it, I had 14 young people came, uh, all Chinese, okay, 14 young people came to me and said, Pastor, you want, we want you to be our pastor, and we want to start a church together with you. So I said, okay, great. And also, one of the first things I did was that I said, you want a pastor with me? There's only one way, okay, you got to pray with me. You don't pray with me, you don't walk with me. Come on, that's my demarcation line. When anybody comes and tells me, I want to go full time with you, no problem. Come and see me tomorrow morning, if I have a talk. Oh, suddenly got quiet. <laughs> All right. Because I don't mean the restaurant, I mean the prayer closet. Okay? If you come meet me in the prayer closet, I'm not going to walk with you. Right? That's why History Maker is the most unusual conference. Starts at 5.30 in the morning. It's the demarcation line. Are you with me? You can't come for prayer. Forget about reaching the world. Why? It's not going to happen. It's a nice dream. Okay? Not going to happen. So these young people came together. We started praying. And they thought, you know, and this, all these young people were ex Methodists. And they thought, man, this guy's crazy. You know, all he wants to do is pray. I said, no. Start praying. Revival will come. So they started coming and, you know, start praying, praying with me. And then suddenly one day God says, okay, I want you to take them to this nation. Okay, long story, you heard it before. And that nation was Taiwan. Because right about the same time, major earthquake hit that nation. 
And the Lord told me, take them to the center of it. I said, okay, no problem. Long story short, at the end of six days, we had 2,000 conversions. 2,000 conversions, not 200, not 20, 2,000 conversions. Okay, the guy who organized the meeting was the vice president of Xerox. He was standing there weeping. He said, I waited 30 days for this. 30 years rather, he said, I waited 30 years to see this. I've never seen it before, first time I'm seeing it. Started weeping. And I stood there and I know the only reason why they happened is because of the anointing. Hallelujah. So as I went back home, I said, you know what? I'm not going to go back to my same mode of operation. Come on now. Right? I'm not going to do church the way everyone else does. I'm going to start pursuing this anointing. Why? Because if I have the anointing, things start working a lot faster. A lot easier. Okay? So I started pursuing it. I started pursuing the harvest. Okay? You know, and, you know, you know, one of the things I saw was, you know, easily, I saw thousands of people come to the Lord. I stopped counting after I reached about 50,000. I stopped counting. Why? No point. Let heaven come. Right. Hallelujah. You know why? Because that's not what it's about. It's about winning souls. Yes. Just keep winning. Hallelujah. You know, and what I realized was that the greatest secret that God gave me was the Holy Ghost. And what he carries and what he delivers to me is called the anointing. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if I can learn how to carry the capacity of the anointing, I can win. Come on. Right? I can win. This should be my greatest secret. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So there we go, Pastor Mary. 12 minutes. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at some of the principles that are hidden okay, in First Kings. Let's start first with something very familiar. First Kings, okay, seventeen, okay, one, two, and three. Just write these scriptures down, right? So Elijah said, Elijah said, okay, in the presence of whom I stand, there shall be no rain in these days except at my command. Okay? And we know the secret, why? Because we find the secret of why he was able to do that in James chapter 5, okay? verse 17 and 18. Right? Elijah was a human, just like ours, us, but he prayed earnestly. Okay? Some, some language it says, pray fervently. Right? As he prayed, what happened? The rain stopped. Right? So, what is the first principle of the anointing, right? The first principle, and I want to give you something very familiar, the first law rather, of the anointing, is the law of prayer and fasting. Okay? The law of prayer and fasting. Okay? And this law is rather interesting. Let's go a little bit deeper. Matthew chapter 17, verse 19. And the disciples having come to Jesus said, okay, why okay, are we not able to cast him out? Okay? And Jesus said to them, Okay? You want, okay? Through, though you want faith to work, right? Even if your faith is a mustard seed, the mountain can be removed. But this kind goes out except by fasting and prayer. Right? So Jesus is saying here, okay, this what? The reason why this demon could not go was because this demon only goes by fasting and prayer. Okay? Watch this. This is chapter. <coughs> 17. But in Matthew 10, look at Matthew 10. Okay? And having called his disciples, he gave them power over unclean spirits so as to be casting them out. What is this? Matthew 10, he gave them power over casting out demons. Matthew 17, they can't cast out demons. Right? Very strange. Why? Because I thought he already gave them power. And how come they can't cast him out? So obviously, what we see is that, okay, our conclusion is that, guess what? There is a greater dimension in the anointing. Okay? You can't corner the anointing. You can't say, I have the anointing. It's kind of like, you know, the best illustration I can give you is like, you know, the capacity that you have in finance. Right? All of us can walk into a burger 
John tonight and buy a burger. Right. That's not even a doubt, right? But can all of us go, walk into a car showroom and buy a car? Some of us can. Some of us can. Right? Yeah. Can all of us go into okay, a housing agency and buy a house? Oh boy. Isn't that interesting? Why? The more the requirement, the less of us can do it. One. But the value is what? Still money. It's still money. Sing with the anointing. Sing with the anointing. You have the anointing, but the capacity can only take you to some level. It doesn't mean that anointing can take you to the whole level. Are you following me? Right? So let's go a little bit, little bit deeper along the same lines. Let me show you something else. This one is even more astounding. I'm sure you have seen it before, but let me just point it out. Acts chapter 19, right? So even they brought, okay, from his body handkerchief and aprons, okay? And the sickness departed from them. Evil spirits also went forth from them. Think about it. Paul was preaching, they grabbed handkerchief. Okay? And they brought the handkerchief home. Somebody there that was demon possessed. And they threw the handkerchief on the guy. Demon came out. Amazing thing. You know, <clears throat> this handkerchief never made any noise. Think about that. Right? That, you know, because what? We will, sometimes, you know, I, I've seen this in some places, you know, I've seen this in some churches, where they think, that the anointing means volume. Come on. Come on, louder! 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 And here everybody got no voice. <laughs> the only thing that got delivered was their voice. <laughs> the devil is just standing there laughing. <laughs> screaming and screaming. Hey, anger chief had no voice. <laughs> Come on. No momentum. He just dropped and the guy and the demon went ah! the demon said I'm out of here man that's Paul, Paul wasn't even there it was just his handkerchief why? because the capacity of that handkerchief was greater than he met it in so are you seeing this? Okay, capacity does not mean volume. Capacity means presence. Hallelujah. Amen. Presence. So what we focus on is presence. Come on. Right? Not methodology. Are you with me? Right? Sometimes, you know, the, the, when the anointing comes, people may not be screaming. People may not be loud. Tears are flowing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your heart's getting changed. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So when we look over across and we say, man, they are not responding. Yes. They are. Right. <laughs> look at their face. Right. Are you following me? Yes. Maybe they're not running to the altar, but they already made the altar there. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. They already got delivered. You know, it's kind of like Europe. You know, it's kind of funny. I was preaching the second day, the Spirit of God was so strong in Poland. And I was preaching the second day, and I was just, I think, on my fourth, fourth point. Okay? And suddenly, this lady just walks up. Where is she going? Straight to the altar. Another one straight to the altar. And I was like, man, I guess I've got to shut up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right? Because you know, while you're preaching, you can say, No, go back. I got five more points. Who cares about your stupid points? Are you with me? That's not important. What God is already working. Forget about your points. We are not here for a lecture. We are here for presence. Amen. When the presence comes, it's done. Hallelujah. Amen. This so, so the, the anointing increases. Increases. How does it increase? 
fasting and prayer. Okay? There are a few examples here I want to sh share with you. First example is the example that um, a man called Kenneth Hagin, you know, he's already gone with, to be with the Lord. He said when the anointing would come on him, okay, there would be uh, fire, you'll feel like fire over his hands. And whenever, okay, whenever he would feel the anointing in his life dissipating, what it meant was it was time for him to fast and pray. Are you with me? Why? Because when you don't see the anointing functioning, it means go back to the prayer. Are you with me? Why? Because if you don't do that, the, the anointing will continue to dissipate. Right. You see, it, this is our problem. This is our problem. Okay? We are human vessels. We get carried away. More often, you know, than less. You know? If, if we are leading in worship or we're doing something and someone comes and tells us, Oh, you're doing such a wonderful job. Man, it becomes big. Right? <laughs> right? Oh, your preaching was amazing. Oh. <laughs> Suddenly, you know, the head becomes so big. Right? So the next time, now you come up with all confidence. And there is nothing. Right. Everybody knows it, and you know it too. Right. Are you with me? So what are you trying to do? You're trying to stir it. Stir, there's nothing there. The only thing you can do is, Lord, I'm sorry. Amen. Help me, Lord. Amen. Show me some grace. I need to run back to the closet. Why? Because I tried to do it with my strength. Amen. Are you following me? Right? So this is something that you need to understand. In order to maintain the anointing, your prayer must be maintained. Right. In order to increase that anointing, okay, there must be fasting and prayer. If there's no fasting and prayer, you cannot move to another capacity of the anointing. Are you following me? Right? So if there are no there are no breakthroughs in certain areas in your life, it's because okay, that anointing has not been increased and it needs to increase. Okay? God is wonderful, isn't it? Right? God didn't say, okay, you want the anointing? Okay, go get a PhD. Right? You want the anointing? You know, some preachers preach that. It's rubbish. Okay? You want the anointing? Give X amount of dollars. No, that's rubbish. You want the anointing, God said, prayer. Why? Because all of us can do it. Right. Prayer puts all of us on equal platform. That's right. A child can pray, a grown-up can pray. Yeah. It's something we all can do. Amen? Amen? Right? He gives us equal platform and equal opportunity. Right? So number one, Okay, what we understand is that the anointing, amen, the anointing can increase. Right. Depending on the capacity of the anointing that you want to work in your life, right, the first law of the anointing is prayer and fasting. Right. right? So this is the first law that you must remember, right? The first law of the anointing. The second law of the anointing, right, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 22. Elijah said unto the people, I've been left as a prophet of Jehovah by myself, and the prophets of Baal are 450 men. Okay, it was 36. And Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day, thou art God in Israel, and I am thy servant. Okay, I am thy servant. For the anointing to work, okay, you must believe that God gave you the anointing. Come on. Okay? You must believe that God anointed you. Okay? It's not so important whether others believe. You must believe. Right. Why? Because if you don't believe, it's not going to work. Okay? The anointing is not based on an assumption. The anointing is knowing God's anointed me. And that's not prayerful. That's a responsibility. You know, I mean, look at the Apostle Paul's life, right? There are places in, a, in Scripture where he says, I'm the chief among sinners. But there are places in Scripture where he says, I'm an apostle. 
God separated me from birth. He's not shy about it. Why? Because he knew God called him to be an apostle. Hallelujah. Right? Guess what? The problem is what? We have, you know, humility in the place we should not have humility. Come on. We need to know that we are anointed. Right? The devil knows that he's out to destroy. Come on. Right? Even if you try to take a break, guess what? That day he comes up to you. He knows his assignment. You must know who you are. This is important. Amen? Right? So, if you want the anointing to work, you must believe that God has anointed you. Come on. Every single person in this room has been anointed. Why? Because Christos means anointed one. So if Christos lives inside of you, guess what? You are anointed. The measure may be different. Doesn't matter, but you are anointed. Hallelujah. Amen. So because you are anointed, guess what? Right? Based on the anointing that is in your life, God will give you the capacity. God will give you the opportunity. You cannot say, you know what? Let me go get Pastor Barry. That business that God put in front of you, that's not for Pastor Barry, that's for you. Are you following me? That window that he opened is not for Pastor Barry, that was for you. Why? Because God wants to pull that anointing from inside you. Are you following me? I was a young believer, okay? You know, in Asia, you know, in Asia where I grew up, okay, you know, demons don't hide. Okay? You know, when I grew up, when I grew up as a young person in Asia, I knew the demon before I knew God. For me to believe God was not so difficult, why? Because demons exist. Okay? Supernatural was not difficult, why? It's real. It's real, okay? The young time I used to, you know, walk by, you know, go, go into some, some area where it was like a jungle, they would say, you know, if you hear your voice calling after 6 o'clock at night, you know, if you're walking, your, your voice calls, don't turn around. Why? You turn around, the devil will slap you. So I remember the young man, I'm walking in my head, my name Richard. I'm like, I'm not turning. <laughs> I'm not turning, man. Sorry, I'm not turning. Why? Man, I'll get slapped. So we grew up with the awareness of demons. You know, so I was about 15 years old. One day I was walking, you know, to a certain area, and one of my friends came up to me and says, you know, all of a sudden, he said, there's this girl, long story, there's a demon that shows up in her room every evening, pulls up against the wall, and I mean, all kinds of stuff. And he says, you need to come and help. And I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm like, who's so I was standing there and I heard the Holy Spirit so clear. You go do it. I said, you know, I was thinking, man, I'm going to get my pastor. But it was so clear. The Holy Spirit said, you go do it. So I told the guy, I said, you know what? Um, where's this girl at? He said, this place. You know what? Okay. If I walk in now, probably the demon will jump on me. I don't feel quite ready. Give me seven days. Okay? Seven days, I'll meet you here and you take me to that place. So I went back seven days, I couldn't eat. I don't know whether I was scared of God or scared of the devil. Maybe a bit of both. Right? So after seven days, I came and he was waiting for me. At the end of seven days, I said, Let's go. So I went into this place where this girl was attacked by demons literally every day. I walked in. And there are 25 young people there. I'm like, what's this crap? And they're all like, oh, we heard the exorcist is coming. <laughs> we came to watch. And I'm like, this is fun. I'm just learning how to cast demons, and 25 people already show up. <laughs> so I knew it's not a show. So I told them, I said, I'm going to cast the devil out. Okay, guess what? After I cast him out, what will he do? They looked at me. I said, you look for one of you. Yeah. When he leaves there, he's going to go home with one of you. So if you want you to go, if you want him to go home with you, stay. If not, run. They all ran. <laughs> all 25. What? It's not a show. Yeah, Are you with me? It's not a show. So, you know, long story 
very sure the girl was delivered. That was my first exposure to casting devil out. You know, the girl was delivered. But what am I saying? Okay, you must believe in the anointing that God's put over you. So in the course of your day, in the course of your week, in the course of your month, if there are windows of opportunity that opens for you, for the anointing, the function, those are no accidents. They are set ups. Why? Because heaven is in the process of equipping you. Hallelujah. If there's only one person in the church who can cast out demons, we are in trouble. If there's only one person who can pray for the sick, we are in trouble. Come on. We need the entire body to do that. Hallelujah. Amen. So the second point is that you must believe. Okay. You must believe in the anointing that God gave you. And this is not arrogance. This is confidence. Right. In the anointing. Confidence in the one that called you. Hallelujah. Amen. Right. You must have confidence. Why? Because it shows that you are dependent. Right. Dependent on God. To use you. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Right? So if you don't believe, guess what? It will not work. In Mark chapter 6, verse 6, you know, it says that Jesus marveled at the unbelief. Right? He marveled. He went around healing the sick. But when he went to this particular village, nothing happened. Why? Because they did not believe. Okay? When unbelief is there, guess what? The anointing does not work. <coughs> Right? It does not work. So what do you need to do? You need to raise up, okay, that confidence level that God has anointed me. Amen. Right? That anointing is in my life, amen, to be used of God. So you must understand that and you must recognize that. Interesting. Why? Because Mark chapter 6 says that. But at the same time, right, if you look at Mark chapter 5, and also later on in Mark chapter 6, right, verse 56, you can see that they heard about the healing that Jesus performed, right? And the all the sick came. He says they laid the sick on the street. They brought them so that they might touch him. They might touch the border of his garment and be made whole. Interesting. Right? There was nothing wrong with Jesus. The anointing was ever present in him. Okay? But it's their believing capacity that released that anointing. Amen. Are you following me? So, guess what? If it doesn't work, increase your believing capacity. Come on. Why? Because God's anointing always works. Hallelujah. Amen? It always works. So if something doesn't work, okay, you step back and you say, "What, well, Lord, why is it not working? Maybe I'm touching it wrongly. I'm tapping it wrongly. You know, when my daughter was four years old, um, she used to go to a, a preschool right by my house. And my wife, you know, always brings her to the preschool. And I didn't know that as they were going to the preschool every day, they were having prayer meeting, you know, on the journey to the preschool. So one day, you know, I, I was on not working, so I said, let me take you to the preschool. So I was walking into the preschool and, you know, along the path, there's always a lot of idols and stuff like that. So as we were getting closer to her preschool, next to her preschool is a temple. Okay? And when she came closer to the temple, she's only four years old, she got so upset. I mean, she got upset. And she's like, in the name of Jesus, a tree fall down on the temple. You know, and she was like calling fire from heaven oh. on the temple. And I looked at her and I said, why are you getting so upset? She said, when I sit in my classroom, the smoke from the temple comes into my class. And we would smell all that. So I don't want that. I want this temple to be closed and move. Oh. I said, whoa, four years old, man. You know, what a capacity of faith. So, you know, dropped off in class and went back home. And then about two months later, I had my turn again to bring her to preschool. So I was walking with her, and suddenly as I came closer to the preschool, I noticed that the temple doors were shut. So I was like, no. So I said, you just wait here, I need to go check something out. Okay? 
So I made a stand on the side of the road there. I said, wait there. I crossed over and I wanted to read. There was a note on the door of the temple. I walked over and I looked at the door, the note on the door of the temple. It says, temple closed. I came back to her and I said, temple is closed. She said, yeah, of course. <laughs> I said, wow, this is good for you. So, you know, I dropped off in school and that Sunday I shared that testimony in church. So, you know, my whole country is full of temples. So I one church member walk up to her and said, you know, Michaela, can you come to my area? Because there's a big temple next to my house. Can you help shut it down? You know what she said? That's not my problem. <laughs> she said, that's your problem. It's not closed because you never pray. I'm like, man, I'm a pastor. I'm going to walk away from this one. But you know, I was thinking, so theologically sound. Never been to Bible college. But why? Because she believed. She believed. She didn't need any fancy prayer language. She didn't need any formula. She just needed the capacity of faith to say temple closed down and it shut down. The temple never reopened. Ever again. Why? Why? Because you believe. Imagine if you believe how much the anointing will increase in your life. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go to point number three. Okay. These are just some foundation and then we will go a little bit deeper. Point number three. Okay. First Kings. First Kings chapter 19 verse 11. And he said, go forth and stand in the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind rented the mountains, broke into pieces the rock. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after that, the wind was the earthquake, and the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, a small, still small voice, and it was so that Elijah heard it. He wrapped his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Right? The third law okay, in functioning in the anointing is the ability to differentiate. Okay? The voice of God from the effects of the anointing. Come on. Okay? Must, if you're going to function in the anointing, you must differentiate the voice of God from the effects of the anointing. Why? Because when the anointing functions, there will be a lot of effects. Come on. Right? And the effects can cause you to be distracted. Are you following me, right? Let me make an, another statement here, right? Emotion does not equal anointing. Okay? Anointing may produce emotion, but emotion does not produce anointing. Come on. Just because, okay, you scream louder does not mean God will show up. You may lose your voice, that's for sure. Okay? But it does not mean that God will show up. Why? Because emotion has got nothing to do with the anointing. Are you following me? Right? It's the important point. So anointing may result in the emotions. Right? So the greater way is that even, right, in the midst of, for example, in the midst of praise and worship, I've seen this so many times, you know, in my Christian life. Where some Sundays you go into church and there's a great worship and a great move of God. And the next Sunday is like God's day. Same church. Same church. Why? Last week we had it. It was so good. Next Sunday. What happened? Same, same song. Come on. Right? Same group of people, you know, same light skin. You know, Christians like to talk about atmosphere. Right? Okay? All that is right, but 
No anointing. Why? Because God's not a copy. He's original. Okay? If you're going to be effective walking with God, okay, you don't tell Him what to do. Okay? I'm, I'm telling you, you know, now this, this is a new trend now. Okay? There are a lot of new trends out there. And some of the new trends is like, for example, someone is, you know, I, I, just, I had a problem one time with one of my worship leaders. Okay? He got so upset. Why? Because he felt that every time he needs worship, we got to sing his song. His song was the song. And I'm like, <laughs> I say, I'm a preacher. I don't even, I can't even preach what I want to preach. Boss tells me what to preach. Sometimes he wants me to score people. I don't like that. You know what? You know what I like to do? I like to just crack jokes. Make people laugh. Are you with me? Lord, I flew 5,000 miles to score people. Like some anti prophet. Are you kidding? I said, you make me, you make all these people not like me. You know, I, I've been in some meetings, I'm not kidding. The word is so strong. After I'm done, I'm walking on people. Are. It's the presence. Oh, yeah. 
every time we come into this place, we got to find our way in. With no assumptions. Yes. With no preconceived notion. Lord, where are you? Where are you? I want to hear you. I want to know you. I want to touch you. I want to see you. Yes. If we come with this attitude every time, it will be bullseye. Yes. Bullseye. You will hit that anointing and it will change you. You walk out, you know, I'm not kidding. When I was a young boy, we used to go to Morris for those meetings. That guy was the biggest joker. All right. Such power, such anointing he carried. You know, he used to say, come back tomorrow night and I will tell you the secret. I was a young man, your friend, bro. 15, 16 years old. Man, I'm going to come back, man. Come on, man. The guy's giving the secret. You know, sit in the front row, you get Anointing plus saliva. <laughs> Short Jewish guy, he's got a lot of spit. Sometimes on your face, you know. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> My God. You know, it's like, man, I've got shower blessing here. So we come back the next day and we're like, wow, oh, I want to find out what's the secret of the kingdom. And he says, I'll give you the secret. You know, and he speaks like this, he doesn't move too much. You know, he stands still. And he says, tomorrow night, Can't even take credit. You know what I'm saying? 
Can you imagine printing out the program? Don't know who's speaking. Okay, there was, there's one guy even more funny. This 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 pastor who came to our conference, recent conference. You know, he ministers a lot in Mexico. And on the last day, I just found I was standing there worshiping, and God says, "Ask him to do a workshop." And I walked up to him. I said, "You do a workshop." The guy looks at me. You want me to go to the workshop? I said, "No, no, no, no. not go to the workshop. You lead the workshop." <laughs> he said, "I paid a hundred dollars to join the conference. I see I'm not your speaker. Welcome." <laughs> He couldn't understand it. He was like, what? I said, hallelujah, welcome to the club. 30 years I've been following. Hallelujah. If you want the anointing to function, amen, you've got to learn how to listen. You've got to learn how to move when God moves. Come on, right? There are times when the presence is so strong, respond. Respond. When the times, there's no presence. You know what? Shut the place down. Go to Taco Bell. <laughs> Hallelujah. Go to Pastor Barry's house, man. Go there and hang out. What? Done. Nothing. Are you with me? Learn to flow with the way the Lord wants to flow. Amen? If he is there, move with him. If he can switch, switch with him. Amen. You know, allow him to be the one that will take the leadership and the initiative. Are you here? Amen. Amen? So, you know, it's very important that we recognize this, right? John chapter 5, and says, Then those men, it was 14, 5, 14, when they had seen the miracles that Jesus did, and this is of the truth, and this is of the truth that the prophet should have come into the world. Verse 15, Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force and make him king. Okay, look at that. So he departed the king into the mountain by himself alone. Right? You know, it started out well. There was miracles that started happening. But suddenly, it switched. How did it switch? Now, they want to take Jesus forcibly and make him king. So what did Jesus do? Perceived it. Okay? If it was a you know modern day preacher, he would love it. Oh yeah. Oh man, you're giving me all the attention that I want. Are you following me? Like last night, you know, last night, you know, the Holy Spirit moved here. You know, it was so powerful. And when I saw everybody praying and I was standing there, I just heard the Holy Spirit say, You're done. I said, Thank you. I went back to my closet. My job was over. Right. Are you with me? Then I was thinking, as I was walking, I was thinking, people are thinking, this preacher is really strange. The meeting is over, open the eyes, the guy is gone. Is he, did he get raptured? <laughs> are you with me? You just follow. You just follow, you know? You just follow when the Lord moves, you move. When your job's done, you're done. <laughs> Okay? So you must learn when is the timing, why? Because if you give yourself too much attention, you will be distracted. You know, I mean, there are people today, you know, I, I, I go into some circles, you know, Pastor Barry, Pastor Clay, I probably know this, some circles, man, they keep adding more titles. You know, everybody I know suddenly became a bishop. <laughs> and I tell them, you add so many titles, what else do you have left? Are you going to call yourself God? Come on, where, where does this end? Why? Why are you stressing yourself? Don't. Okay? Avoid your, you know, so I'm telling you, I have my preachers. Okay? I said, hi brother, how are you? I'm a brother, I'm a prophet. Really? Can you call fire down from heaven? Right. Burn yourself. <laughs> Not me, I'm going to burn. Right. You know, I've been under that fire. Are you with me? They get upset, and I'm like, you got to be kidding. You're so hung up on your stupid title. How are you going to introduce yourself when Jesus shows up? 
sacrifice towards them. Now what does the apostle Paul do? He rents his garment. He says, come on! I'm just like you! Are you following me? It's very important. If you want the anointing to be maintained in your life, you are reachable, touchable. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. People, does not, people do not just know about your strengths, but they also know about your struggles. Right. Come on. Yeah. Right? Because you don't want to, you know, every time you share testimony, it's all how great thou art. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah. And when people are listening to you, my God, that's so unreachable. Yeah. You're not helping anybody. Okay? Neither am I saying that every time you talk, you must go and share about, you know, I'm struggling with depression, oppression, and all the pressures. <laughs> that doesn't help people either. They'll be like, what did Pastor Barry invite? <laughs> the dude's got more problem than us, man. And he's the one preaching. Can you imagine? Right? No, I'm not saying that. But you know where I'm going with this. Right? So you got to be careful that, you know, you show God's divinity, but you also show your humanity. Right? That's why, you know, that's why I like humor. Why? Because humor helps me to present to people the ability that, hey, I'm just like you. Hallelujah. Amen? You know? And that's what I like about Pastor Perry. Why? Because he's humorous. You know? In our last conference, he came out riding a horse. <laughs> you are being kidding. You should have seen some of my friends. <laughs> They're all like, where did you find this guy? <laughs> I'm kidding. But you know, to me, they asked me, what are you doing? Where did you get this guy? Because the guy before him was a serious preacher. <laughs> There's another pastor from North Carolina. He's an ex-marine. Boom, boom, boom. And the next one comes riding a horse. <laughs> there goes. Bye, Holy Spirit. See you next week. That's not true. That is not true. If that is true, children cannot be in the presence. is not moved by that. God is moved by reality. You know, I I love the fact that when he did it, I just wish he told me. <laughs> That's the only thing. You know what? Because I'm the organizer. Even I was shocked. <laughs> he's telling me, he's telling me, just give me a signal when he introduced me, you know, and Pastor Claire was waiting at the door and I'm like, What's she waiting in the door? What's she going to come out in? You know, I was thinking, maybe he's going to come out with armor or something. You know, some outfit or something. That comes on this place. Oh my goodness. You know what? Okay? It changed the whole tone of the meeting. Okay? What did it do? It gave people a different capacity to understand God. You know, I used to sit in a Bible college, don't want to mention the name of the Bible college, but once a year, the president of the school would bring a cult leader. I'm not kidding, I'll sit in the school, and he'd bring a cult leader and teach. And we are sitting in the class, we are like, huh? What is this guy teaching? It's all rubbish. <laughs> and the guy walks out, and the president comes in, he says, okay, now tell me, Everything that did was done wrong. Everything that was correct and everything that was wrong. And you know, and one of his points was, if you do not know how to differentiate, why? Because most Christians live in a bubble. We only know how to tap on the anointing when it comes in a certain form. If it changes form, we don't know how to respond. Come on, that's why, you know, when we come to church, okay, just imagine if you come to church one Sunday and there's no worship. Some people will leave church. Some people will get upset. Why? Because that's not what they're accustomed to. Okay? God doesn't work according to our custom. He works according to His Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen? So we must, we must remain flexible. Okay? It's not important.
important. Okay? God does not look at okay, the, the methodology. God looks at the spirit. Amen? God looks at the heart of a man. That's what the scripture says. Right? Right? It's very important for us to recognize that. So point number three. Okay? The law number three that we see. We must have the ability to differentiate the voice of God from the effects of the anointing. Right? There are a lot of effects in the anointing. And then point number four. Okay? Point number four. First Kings chapter 21. All in Kings. Okay? Chapter 21. Verse 1. Two and three, okay, all the way down, verse twenty, and then also verse twenty-seven, twenty-eight, and twenty-nine. Right? What we see here is that we see the story of this man called Nabal. Right? He had a vineyard, okay, and Jezebel, okay, Jezebel <coughs> manipulated to get that vineyard for Ahab. How did she manipulate? Basically, she went out there and killed him. Right? Went out there and killed the guy. Got rid of him so that she can get vineyard. And this story is kind of an interesting story because as it, as it goes on, Elijah gets a word for Ahab. So he, you know, Ahab hates Elijah. He hates him. So he comes and stands in front of him and says, I have a word from God. He knows his judgment. Right? So he passes his judgment. As he passes in judgment, interestingly, if you look at it in verse 27, Ahab heard these words, he rented his clothes, put on sackcloth upon his flesh, fasted, laid in sackcloth, and went softly. Verse 28, the word of the Lord came back to Elijah. Amen. Okay? And the Lord says, because Ahab has humbled himself, I will not bring evil in his day. Praise God. Think about it. Think about this. Okay? Let's think about it a little bit deeper. Okay? Elijah is delivering that word. And he already doesn't like Ahab. Him and Ahab do not have good history. Right? So now Ahab has what? Kill the guy. Why? Because he wanted the vineyard to plant herbs. Okay? Everyone in this room want to kill him. Right? So. Elijah comes and says, judgment upon you. So the guy truly goes and repents. And when he repents, God says, it's okay, forgive him. What, what do we see here? And this is a very beautiful thing. Okay? In all that God is doing, okay, the underlying factor is love and compassion. Okay? Anointing does not eliminate love and compassion. Amen. Come on. Amen. Right? Just because you are anointed does not give you an excuse. <laughs> Amen. Okay? To be unmerciful towards people. Amen. Praise God. Come on. Okay? I've seen this. You probably have. You know? Some preachers, when they get anointed, they get used of God, they lose their human touch. Right. Come on. They lose the human touch. They lose that compassion. That they forget they are ministering to people. Are you following me? They think they are ministering to objects, but not people. Right? So, even though Jesus was used so powerfully, right, in an amazing fashion, he never lost his compassion. Right. Come on. Right? So, if you want God to use you in the anointing, Never lose your compassion, right? Behind all the anointing is the compassion of God. Are you seeing this? Yes. Amen, right? This law, okay, the anointing is that the love of God must always be the center. Right? right? You look at another prophet in the Bible called Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah? Yes. Right? One of the main reasons why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh is why? Because he knew God would forgive. Can you imagine that? He said, I don't want to go there and pass judgment because I know you will turn around and forgive them. He already did not like the Assyrians. Okay? And the Assyrians were, you know, the Nineveh were bad people. They were terrible people. Okay? Listen. God loves 
in spite of our prejudices. Okay? God doesn't care about our prejudice. Come on, I'm not kidding, okay? There are some circles, okay? They can't touch the anointing. You know why? Because a person of different color cannot even go in. Why? They don't even make room for them. I get worried, okay? If I go to a church and I only see one color, I have concern. Right? It makes me nervous. Why? Because I'm like, man, I want to preach and run. <laughs> Why? Because these people don't understand the anointing of God. Because the anointing of God is colorblind. Come on. It's colorblind. God doesn't care about age. God doesn't care how young you are, how old you are. God doesn't care where you are from. God cares. Amen? About touching people. Hallelujah. Come on. God cares about reaching people. Right? So if you want the anointing to function, very important. On one side, anointing. On the other side, love and compassion. Hallelujah. Come on. Right? It, you, there, must be, there must be a balance. There must be a balance. You know, I go to places. I go to places, you know, I, I deliver every year when I preach. There's some cities I go, I told those pastors, because those churches, they have no friends. Literally, they're very poor people. And they say, Pastor, we want you to come. I say, not a problem. This is what I want you to do. I say, I want you to buy me a cup of tea. And they look at me and say, cup of tea? Sure we can. Why? Because it's not about money. Okay? But, remember this. I also have a family. Okay? So what do I do in my case? I maintain the balance. Why? Because this is what I do. I need to pay bills. But at the same time, I'm a servant of God. If I just keep doing this in this direction, guess what will happen? Eventually, it will be about money. Okay? If I keep going in this direction, eventually, I will stay and sleeping in the bus stop. So what is the goal? The goal is maintaining the balance. Yeah. Hallelujah. So in order to, for the anointing to function, make sure you do not lose your love and compassion. So the minute I start disliking people, you know what I need to do? I need to stop preaching. I need to go spend time with God. That's right. Why? Because that's what it's all about. That's right. Amen. Come on. When somebody comes up to me and says, I need prayer, and I tell them, sorry, I have no time, I'm in trouble. Why? Because that's part of my call. Okay? I, I'm not kidding. I've gone to places where some preachers come and tell me, man, you take a lot of time to pray for people. I said, isn't that what I'm called to do? Isn't that what I'm called to do? Hey, am I not called to serve people? Or people are called to serve me. I thought it was the other way around. Jesus came to serve. Come on. Not, you know, not to be served, but he came to serve. He came to lay down his life. Amen? So you got to watch your compassion and your love. Okay? If you start losing your love and compassion for people, forget about the anointing. Why? Because both works proportionately. Hallelujah. Amen? That's point number four. Now let's look at some of the sub-points. Okay? The sub-points... Are a little bit interesting. Okay, let's look at them because they also show us another side of the anointing, right? So, First Kings chapter fourteen, chapter fourteen, verse one. Okay, it says that Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. Okay, First Kings fourteen, verse twelve. Arise, thou go, therefore get into thy own house. When thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. Verse 13, Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for only of Jeroboam, right, shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing towards the Lord, God of Israel and the house of Jeroboam. Very strange story. There's a little child here that dies. There's Jeroboam, okay, who's not a very good guy. And God shows mercy and restores him, okay. So you're like, Scratching your head. The child should live. That guy should go. Right? Our logic, our human logic would say, Lord, sometimes I don't understand what you are doing. Come on. Okay? What is the principle here? Okay? When you function in the anointing, 
you only know in part. Right? You do not know the other side of the story. Okay? There are things you don't understand. I have prayed for people that I wish live, they die. I have prayed for people I wish, and I'm going to say this. <laughs> I'm a preacher, I should be saying this, but you know, I'm like, man, this guy needs to go. Right? I look at them like, man, that old chicken. Surviving, man. You can't kill that thing. Okay? You don't understand? The place I thought resurrection will come, it doesn't come. The place I thought death will come, resurrection comes. When you function in the anointing, you only know in part. There's another part, which is what we call the wisdom of God. Right. What do you do? Hallelujah. You trust yes. in His wisdom. Yes. Right. Although you don't know. Yeah. You don't understand. Are you with me? Amen. Right? Like, you know, sometimes you see an innocent baby die. An innocent person dies. You're like, Lord, why that happened? Why there was there a tsunami? Why was there an earthquake that swallowed up that whole village? Why? What did that people do? We don't know. Right. Are they making? Of course not. <clears throat> but why did that happen? I trust in the wisdom of God. I don't know now. But someday, I will know. In my present capacity, I only know Are you following me? So if you want to function in the anointing, okay, you don't have all the answers. Right. Don't assume you do. Yeah. Don't put yourself there. Why? Because if you put yourself there, you're setting yourself up for that. <laughs> Come on. Sometimes, you know, when somebody walks up to you and says, why did that happen? You know what's the best answer? You know, honestly, I don't know. I'm clueless. Don't set yourself up. I have every answer. I'm the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> You're setting yourself up for failure. Are you following me? Right? What do you do? Father, I trust in your wisdom. I don't understand. Why? I pray as hard. This case. This one stay, that one way. Okay? What do you do? You give God the capacity to become the deciding factor. If you and I can always decide, I guess we don't need him. Right? If you and I in the capacity where we can change everything. Now what's his room? Why would I need greater dependency? You know, when I used to struggle, when I used to smuggle Bibles into China, you know, when I, I remember after I smuggled about 52 times without getting caught, okay, you know what happened to me? I became a know-it-all. Why? Because 52 times, man, I can sniff where the Holy Ghost is. <laughs> I'm the Holy Ghost hound dog. <laughs> okay, you know what happened? Right. I got busted right. so bad. My God, I got it. They interrogated me. I'm standing there, and I could hear the Holy Ghost whisper, Humble now. <laughs> Thank you. Why? Because this is the flesh. So I said, thank God for YouTube. I want to look up. 
Shoot it in the door. And I fixed it. So I said, look at it. I fixed it. You know? And she's like, don't get carried away. I'm like, man can't even enjoy a little moment of pride here. <laughs> It was so funny, you know, I mean, it was hilarious, I was laughing. I was like, you know, so for the next one day, I, was, I felt really good about myself, you know. I'm like, man, it's wonderful, oh, thank you. Ooh, I like my fingers, I can fix things now. And then the next day, something else breaks down in my house. And I'm like, ah, I can do it, piece of cake. I did that. That's not, that's not a problem. I'm not kidding. I look at it, I strip it, I put it back together. It's not working. So at the end, my wife looks at me and says, come on, call the handyman, you can't do it. And I'm like, man, I hate this pride I got swallowed on. <laughs> so the handyman comes, this is all the guy does, I'm not kidding. He comes, he walks up, okay, he has some kind of a tube, he goes zoop, zoop, he walks away, turns it on, it works. <laughs> Jesus, this is a heaven's moment. I felt so humble. Okay? So every time I look at that thing, I was like, mm, feeling good. I looked up, I'm like, oh, dear. <laughs> you know what I like? God knows how to put us in our place. Yeah. You know what that's called? It's called the mercy. Okay. Thank God his lessons maybe only cost $50. Amen. Thank God his lessons are not a jail sentence. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are you with me? Even in his lessons, he's merciful to us. <gasps> Hallelujah. Amen. So what am I saying here? Okay. This is point number five is very important point. Okay. As you see, as you look at the anointing, you understand the anointing. Okay. There are things. Okay? In the anointing, we don't know. We don't understand. Okay? We got to leave it to the wisdom of God. We got to leave it to the capacity of God. Point number six. Okay? First Kings chapter 13. Okay? Verse 8, 9, and 10. And then verse, from verse 15, 16, and 17. The man of God said unto the king, Okay? If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go into with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. Okay, there's this man of God, young prophet, okay, going into the city, and the Lord told him very clearly, don't go in. Do anybody's house don't eat. Kind of strange story in Kings. I see he's coming out, there's an older prophet. All the prophets said, come to my house and eat. Okay? And the older prophet lies to him. Doesn't tell him the truth. So he goes in and eats. And as he comes out after eating, it's a lion that stands in the path and eats him up. Completely kills him. Okay? What is the point here? Why? Because this has got to do with the anointing too. Okay? God does not contradict his command. Okay? God does not contradict his command. Okay? It's important for us to listen to what God is saying. The direction he's saying, but it's important for us to listen carefully. Why? It's important for us to identify details. Okay? And God does not change his mind on details. Right? Somebody can prophesy and say, the Lord says that he's going to visit us. He's going to pour his spirit this Sunday. You know? And then somebody stands up. He's not coming Sunday. He's coming Monday. Okay, number one, who cares? He's coming. Okay, number two, listen, he doesn't contradict. Okay, today there's a lot of contradiction in the body of Christ. Come on, right? There's a lot of distraction in the body of Christ. Okay, some places you go, I'm not even kidding, some places you go, Okay, they, they have included a lot of things okay, in the church. They call it Pentecostal. I don't know, I scratch my head. Because some of the things, I don't see part of scripture. Come on. Okay? 
To me, show me some scripture to what you are doing. Come on, you know, if if it is of God, you don't need to add on ceremonies. Come on, God doesn't need to add on stuff. You know, like, you know, there is some church that we work with. You know, we have been working with, but, you know, now we, we've decided that the direction that they've been going is wrong. Why? Because one of those churches, you know, suddenly they had a vision where they saw Jesus riding a white horse. And lo and behold, I walk into the church the next time, and there's an actual horse made out of clay. And I look at it and I'm like, wow, now there's a horse. What are you going to bring next? Elephant? What are you going to try to turn this thing into? A zoo? Are you following me? Where is this thing going through? See, listen, when they started, they were genuine. But along the way, what happened? They got distracted. Okay, some churches like, oh, you know, they have this thing called prophetic painting. Okay? I'm not against it, but my question is, show me in scripture. Where is the place for prophetic painting? Number one. Number two, a lot of the places where they do prophetic painting, it's prophetic distraction. Why? Because everybody is not worshipping. You are looking at the guy. I don't see the logic of that ministry towards that. I can agree that there are points maybe God may give somebody a revelation. Why? Because God can work outside the box. But when you try to take something like that and make that a form. Amen. There you go. We're in trouble. Are you following me? Right. It's just like, you know, worship dance. You know? I love where, you know, churches have worship teams up ahead. It's wonderful. But sometimes when I go to those churches and I see the worship team, that dancing team is a distraction. It's a total distraction. Why? Because those guys know they have subcontracted the worship. Uh, 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 uh. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Why? Because now you got seven people up there. You're not doing this. Seven, eight people dancing. You know what the rest are doing? Subcontracted. You know what subcontracted? That means now I don't have to dance. Right. We hire people to dance. There is a place for that. But you've got to be careful. Why? Because what was started, okay, maybe with the right motivation, along the way got distracted. Are you following me? Got distracted. Like this pastor that we've been working with. You know, first was the horse. And then after a while, suddenly, you know, I walked in the next time and he had angel figurines that were made. And I looked at it and I'm like, oh my God, angel figurines. I said, what are you going to do? Next time you're going to have a figure of me? <laughs> that won't be very nice in church. You know? And I, and I looked at it and I'm like, this is going towards idol worship. Right. I thought scripture says, don't make any graven image. What are you going to do? Right? 
Was she anointed? Yes, she was. But what happened? Along the way, she got distracted. Come on. She got distracted, right? So what do we have to be careful of, right? As we look at the anointing here, we've got to be careful. Okay, these, are, these, are, these are very important points, right? God does not contradict His command. Never contradict His command. I was at the church, you know, about three months ago. You know, my wife and I, we wanted to just stand up and walk out. The preacher concluded the meeting and he says, you know, he was talking about the 72-hour turnaround. Most powerful sermon I ever heard this last year. Most powerful sermon. But the last part I didn't like. He said, you want the, you want the 72 hour turnaround? Very easy. Today, you got to give $720. <laughs> oh. The $720 will give you the 72 hour turnaround. That's rubbish. Okay? You know what that's called? Extortion. Call it for what it is. Do you know what's wrong with the Christian TV in America? That's all it is. It's extortion. Half the time when you turn the channel, someone is asking for money. How do you expect people to get saved? Imagine they are looking at the Christian channel and they say, Man, on TV is asking me for money. If I go to the church, what's he going to ask me for? My blood and my organs? Are you following me? Right? So, you know, we've got to be very careful. Why? We must not manipulate God's word to our benefit. Okay? And the anointing, okay, the anointing does not contradict God. Amen? Wow, it's getting quiet. There's two more points. Okay, point number seven. Point number seven. First Kings chapter 20, verse 35. And a certain man and the sons of the prophet said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. Then he said unto him, Thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord. Behold, as soon as thou depart from there, a lion shall slay thee. As soon as he departed from there, a lion found him and slew him. Okay? Very strange story again in 1 Kings 20. Right? As this prophet, he tells him, Slap me! Why are we going to slap you? Okay? Later on in the story we find out that that slap was used okay, as a descriptive sermon, basically. As a descriptive example towards the king. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like for example, Isaiah walked around naked. Hosea married a prostitute. What are these things? It's not that God is condoning them. But God uses them as illustrative sermons. You following me? Right? What am I saying? Okay? Point number seven. Sometimes, okay, there is a price for the anointing. Okay? What is the price for the anointing? You become part of the anointing. Come on. You represent the anointing. I know people, when the anointing comes on them, they feel pain. In some parts of their body. Nothing wrong with them. But they feel a certain pain. An abdominal pain. You know, a pain on the leg. Pain on the neck. And they're like, why am I having this pain? And then they would say, there's somebody here who has a pain in the abdomen. And true enough, there's somebody. And the person gets healed. And I'm thinking, why do they have to feel it first? Come on. Why? The anointing, okay, that's a number one. There's a price for the anointing. The anointing has a cost. Okay, number two, the anointing, okay, you become part of the anointing. Right. Are you following me? Right? Like for example, in Hosea's case, why did he have to marry the prostitute? There was a price he had to pay as a prophet. Come on, I don't think anybody in the New Testament want to pay that kind of price. Right? right? Secondly, God used that to show the compassion he had. For people like that. So he became an illustration of the mercy of God. Not everybody is called to that. But what a wonderful ministry he had. What an amazing example he was. Are you following me? Some people say, I want the anointing. Listen, it will cost you. It will cost you. Lord, I want to carry the anointing of the apostle Paul. 
Three times in prison. Mm -hmm. It will cost you. Right. Okay? We think the anointing comes best by going to Bible school. Mm -hmm. That's a cost. Okay? There's no professor in the world that can train you for the anointing. He can teach you about the anointing, but the Holy Spirit gives you all the exams. Right. <laughs> Come on. He is the one who qualifies you. So what happens? You become okay, a living example of that anointing. Hallelujah. Come on, right? So that is point number seven. Amen? Let's look at this last few finishing points here. Okay? The, so you identify okay, with the prophecy. You identify with the anointing. So what happens here also is that the anointing requires a certain level of yieldedness. Okay? To allow your life to become His life. Right? If you want the anointing, it's got to work in fullness in your spirit, in your soul, in your body. Come on. In your spirit, in your soul, in your body. See, you don't know, you don't know suffering until you go through it. You don't know difficulty until you go through it. Right? So sometimes before the anointing or the breakthrough comes, God allows hardship. Why? So that when the anointing eventually comes, you realize there was another part. Okay? The part that people see is only the good side. Right? So what will they, what will God see? God will see humanity and divinity. Okay? God will see his grace and also his power. He does, he does not just want us to function in power without grace. He wants us to function in both capacities. Are you with me? Amen? Right? Point number eight and the last one. Okay? First Kings 22. Verse 10, 11, and 12. Okay? And also verse 7. Can I write this down? Can I read the whole chapter? Okay, this story is about King Jehoshaphat. He's looking for a prophetic word. And verse 11 says, Zedekiah stood up. He says, Shall I go in after the Syrians? And Zedekiah stands up and he says, You go and you will win. Okay? And so, there's another prophet called Micaiah. And he's... Okay? In prison right now. So Joshua stands up and says, Is there any other prophet that we can get verification from? He says, Yeah, there's another prophet, but we have locked him up. And what he has to say, you probably won't like. Okay, so they bring him out of prison and they ask him, So what is the word? He said, The word is whatever you want. Okay? He knows he's not telling the truth. Right? So they dig him further and they say, Come on, tell us what is the truth. And his word is complete. Completely opposite of the word of Zedekiah. <coughs> Come on, right? What can we learn from here, right? Two things. Your life must be consecrated when you are under the anointing. Zedekiah, when he released that anointing, of course he thought it came from God. Right? Because he was a prophet. He was a known prophet. Why would he release a false prophecy? No way. But Micaiah also released a prophecy, but it's completely different. Come on, think about it. This is my last point. Okay? Think about it a little bit deeper. Why? Same anointing. One says, go and fight. One says, you go and fight, you will die. What comes to pass? The second one. You go and fight, you will die. Okay? They got angry with him and they threw him in the deepest dungeon after he released that one. So, what is, what is working? What, what is working when the anointing comes on you? Watch this. When the anointing comes on you, you are exposed to the spiritual world. You are open to the supernatural world. What does that mean? 
you are open to both good and evil. You don't just draw angels, you also draw demons. Come on. Okay? I've seen angels, I've seen some big demons. I wish I didn't see demons. But you know what? When you function on the anointing, you are exposed to both. So what's happening? And because you are exposed to both, if you do not keep your consecration, guess what will happen? Okay? If you don't guard your heart and your motivation, what will happen? At one point, you'll be releasing the right word, and at another point, you'll be releasing the wrong word. It's not because of the anointing. It's because of the consecration. Come on. Right? So what does that mean? Which one gives us our examples? Okay? What does that mean? Like for example, you're going to a place. You already know the person. You know all the facts about the person. Right? And the present comes on you and it sends the present. You may even pick up certain things in the spirit. But there's also a timing of how you release them. You following me? Sometimes the word is right, the timing is wrong. Sometimes, okay, the timing is right, the word is wrong. So if you come to a place because you are so exposed where you think that every time I hear it, I must be right, you are already wrong. You are already setting up yourself for failure. Like for example, okay, if, okay, if say, you know, you are, your junior is up there preaching. God would not use you to interrupt that person. Are you following me? If that anointing is functioning to that person, you may feel, man, that word is correct, but you know how I'm fired up. Hello, the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict himself. Right. You will let them finish first. Whatever you have to say, it will come later. Are you following me? So, because now you are so open to the spirit realm, guess what? As much as you are in tune to truth, you are also open to deception. Because in that arena, both function. The only And your accuracy is consecration. Yeah. That's why, okay, there are many preachers who start off at the beginning very effective, very accurate. Example, William Brennan, John Alexander Dowdy. I mean, think about it. John Alexander Dowdy was phenomenal. You know, the years that he was pastor of Zion City, Illinois, not a single person in his church died. Amazing, never conducted a funeral. That's power. Right? But you know how he died? He died sitting on a wheelchair thinking he was Elijah. He lost something along the way. William Branham, another man that was so powerful, he would never move until his angel came. There was an angel that he saw. And the angel would come, you wait for the angel. When the angel would come, he could prophesy with accuracy. Give him your phone number. Such accuracy. Okay? But right at the end, he was exposed to the worst deceptions. The teachings that he came up right at the end of his life contradicted the entire Bible. How? Same anointing. How? Because the anointing sets you up into the supernatural. 
It exposes both sides. If you do not maintain a spirit of humility, if you do not maintain a heart of dependency, you know what? In a split second, the same person who said the right things will be saying the wrong things. I have an actual case in point right now. Somebody was arguing with me six months ago. Oh, so and so walks so close with God. Spends a lot of time praying and weeping before God. Walks so close to God. I said, that's wonderful. But let's see some of the fruit. Yeah. Come on. Why? Because if they walk so close with God, they will start looking like God. That's right. I'm not interested with the title that they put on themselves, but I'm interested with the fruit that they demonstrate. That's right. But if they say they walk so close with God, okay, and now, okay, all they care about is putting themselves in the Fortune 500 magazine. Well, nothing wrong with that. Right. Don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, God puts you there. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, but you say if I walk so close with God and that's your goal, something's wrong. Amen. Come on. If you say I walk so close with God, that's another thing that will happen. You know what? You will have a burden for the lost. Oh, yes. If you say you walk so close with God, you know what will happen? You will start blessing everybody. Right. Why? Because you will start looking like Jesus. Right. Wow. Walking close with God, okay, is not just talking about it. It's living it. It's showing it. It's demonstrating it. <coughs> See, I had a, you know, I had, a, I had to put a pastor in his place. He said, my church walks closest with God. I said, wonderful, show me your missionary list. Yeah. So he looked at me, what do you mean? I said, your church walks so close with God, you should look like the church of Acts. That's right. That's right. If you don't walk like, you don't look like the church of Acts, sorry, buddy. <coughs> you may be trying to get there, you're not there. Come on. That's right. Because when you are there, guess what happens? You become like the church of X. Okay? I was under leaders when I was growing up as a young believer. My pastors, okay, they gave up stuff to pursue God. By the time our church was 100 people, we had 35 full-time missionaries. Wow. People just gave up their jobs and ran after God. Wow. Why? Because that church transformed you when you walked in. When you walked into that place, you could not be the same. Wow. It changed you. You know what that's called? It's called the anointing. Because when you touch it, you cannot be the same. Hallelujah. What am I saying tonight? I can already sense it. Our greatest deposit is the anointing. Our greatest asset is the anointing. It's wonderful that you have an entire church of people that are hungry for it. Maybe 60%. It's wonderful. Why? Because you can pursue it together as a church. You can run after it together. Why? Because today, there are a lot of people who want it, but they're not willing to pay the price. They want it. Okay? They wish for it. They know the nation needs it. But they're waiting for someone else to step in. Okay? Someone else. Church, the greatest anointing 
is coming on the last days, church. And if you want to see this level of anointing, there needs to come new consecration. We heard that at the beginning of this service. All those prophetic words that came out from different people. And after worship was exactly that. There's no more time that we can play games. Okay? As a nation, this nation has gone to a place unless something happens. Okay? America, as you know it, is already in trouble. The only thing that can change America is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Come on. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You know, when Charles Phoenix, the second great awakening, when he touched America, the move of God was so powerful because he gave himself, himself and Father Nash, they, they gave themselves to prayer and consecration. They say that, you know, he, he, Charles Finney, in his books, it says that the words that will come out of his mouth will be like fire. No matter what he said, it would bring great conviction upon the people. You know, today, okay, America has all forms of church. Why? All kinds of technology. All kinds of methodology. You know, feeding programs. Amen. <laughs> Welfare programs. You know, fellowships, clubs. Guess what? People are not getting saved. Okay? We've got more people walking away from the church. We've got more people walking away from God. Why? Because the anointing is missing. We need to come back to the call. Hallelujah. It's already inside of you. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you need to go out there and get. Mm -hmm. It's already inside of you. Yep. If you've been baptized by the Spirit, Hallelujah. it's already there. What do you need to do? You need to increase it. Right. Increase it. Increase the temperature. Increase the intensity. This is what